Hey folks, Michael here, Life Along the Way. Today we're going to talk about something that you see a lot in traditional Christian communities and worship, bowing. Not uh, something that I grew up doing and didn't feel comfortable with it when I first started worshiping God according to the way people had worshipped Him for a long, long time since the beginning. So today we're going to talk about bowing. Why? How? Where to come from? How to do it? Let's get started. So we're going to be talking about bowing. You know, a real simple thing, right? You, we, we, we see it in movies all over the place. We see it in various sorts of customs, both Eastern and Western. There's Asian ways of bowing, bowing, and there's medieval European ways of bowing, and they look more or less the same. It's, it's just simply kind of bending the body or part of the body towards uh, someone who is of equal or greater importance, depending on who, uh, who it is that you're bowing to and in what culture. But I didn't grow up with bowing. Uh, I grew up in a very Protestant world, and uh, we didn't bow at all, or we didn't think we did. And uh, so when I first started into traditional Christianity and there were a lot of people that were bowing and they seemed to kind of more or less be bowing at the same time and in the same places. And I was like, wow, that's, uh, that's interesting. And then it wasn't until I was at a conference where someone actually talked about bowing and how to do it that I finally thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. And as I thought about it, I realized that actually... Uh, I wasn't against bowing, and, uh, and, and most Christians actually aren't against bowing. We, we have all attended baseball or football games or a potluck dinner on the church grounds, and the pastor gets up front and is asked to say a blessing, and how does he start? Bow your heads with me. And everyone, nobody says, well, I don't bow. Everyone just bows their heads and says a prayer, and that's that's a bow. We call that the simple bow in the church. It's fully a bow. So we're not really against bowing. Sometimes we just don't like doing things that uh, don't seem perhaps American or something like that. I don't know. But I realized that I wasn't against bowing. How many times had I just bowed my head at, at, at the prayer, at the football game? And another thing that we can think about as we're approaching this conversation of bowing is that we are human beings that have a body and a spirit, body and soul. We're not just a spirit who's trapped in a flesh suit. But as we talked about earlier when we were going through Genesis, that when God created humanity, when He created mankind, He created us by with the dust of the ground and breathing spirit in, His Spirit into us. And it was the combination that became us, became a human being. And so we are physical creatures, and the things that we do with our body do affect all of us, because as we also talked about in uh, our going through Genesis, is that there's, there's not like part of the world that is for God and the rest of the part of the world is just kind of going to hell in a handbasket. God created all things, including our bodies, and they are good. And it is in, in our body that we, that we work out our, uh, our faith, that we fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know, most of those things have to do with body desires. So we are people who have bodies who are embodied, if you will, and we embody our commitments. You know, if, if you watch the military, they have, they have a way of saluting, right? That's an embodiment of commitment. They're not just sitting there thinking, oh, I respect my superior officer. They embody that commitment, even if they might not respect him, they still embody the commitment. Um, we, when we say the Pledge of Allegiance or, or sing the national anthem, that's a big one we'll get to in just a second, you stand and you put your hand over your heart, right? That is an embody. If you're a man, you take your hat off and you put your hand over your heart. Those are two embodiments of our commitment. We, we believe that something is important. We, we want to show respect for that thing, and we do it in a particular way. Yeah? And, and in America, that is by putting our hand over our heart. We are embodied people. When, uh, 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 over the past few years, as many different communities, sports communities mainly, 
uh, decided not to do that, but rather to take a knee, that was also an embodiment of their commitment. And it communicated. And it was clear uh, what was communicated, right? And we recognized that they were communicating something by embodying differently a different commitment. It was not the same commitment. So we are people who do recognize the importance of embodying our commitments in our world or political world and our social world and those sorts of things. But what about in our worship of God and our prayer life? And, um, you know, when we uh, teach this to a lot of the teachers at, at our school, are kind of new to some of this traditional Christian uh, talk or whatever, ideas. And when we teach this to them, we talk about uh, how in our school assemblies, we say morning prayer with the kids every morning, and then they do a flag raising uh, occasionally, maybe weekly, I don't remember exactly. And then they say the Pledge of Allegiance and on some frequency as well, I don't remember the frequency. But we talk about, regarding those things, we have flag raising and Pledge of Allegiance on one hand, and we have bowing, and also including making the sign of the cross, which is covered in a different video, which are the, the things of the church, right? And we talk about that, they, that as teachers, we allow them, there, there are four possible uh, positions of conscience that they can have, that they could have. At the school, we allow three of those four. What they are is you can either say, I don't believe the embodiment is, of commitment is a real thing and important. And so you can neither embody your commitments uh, to the nation nor embody your commitments uh, to God in the church. So that means you would just stand with your hands by your side during the pledge or during the national anthem and you do not have to cross yourself or uh, bow during, during prayer. So that's a position of conscience one. Position of conscience two is uh, you can believe that the embodiment of commitments is important and, um, and you can choose to embody them in both places, both uh, in the nation, because our, our, we believe that uh, patriotism is a mark of good citizenship. Uh, a well-reasoned patriotism is a mark of good citizenship. So you can embody your commitments uh, in the national th uh, th theater as well as in the church theater by bowing and making the sign of the cross with the rest of us. And you can, the third position of conscience is you can believe that the embodiment of commitments is a real thing, but you're uncomfortable doing that with the nation. So you don't put your hand over your heart. Uh, you can put your hands respectfully by your side while we uh, recite the pledge or sing the national anthem. And, but you, because you do believe that it is a real thing, you can uh, make, the sign of the cross, uh, make the sign of the cross and bow during church. The fourth position of conscience, which we don't allow because we are a Christian school, is where you only embody your commitments to the nation and not to God. That one we don't allow. You know, that, that, that's a legitimate position of an embodiment of commitments that you believe in the nation uh, and you want to respect that with your body but not your God. But since we are a Christian school and under the Trinity on the Border mission, we don't allow that position. So, um, so of the other three, they can either neither uh, embody their commitments in neither, locate, neither uh, point uh, of our day. They can embody their commitments in both points of their day, or they can only embody the commitments at the church. Any of those are acceptable, but only embodying their commitments with the nation we don't allow. So as we're thinking about bowing, this is the embodiment of commitments. And we've now just kind of talk about how to do it, right? That might be why you found this video in the first place. And so let's talk about that. As we already covered, we all, almost all people are aware of what we call the simple bow. And that's just putting your head down. It's called a simple bow. And it's what, what we do when the, the, the pastor says, bow your heads with me. And then he starts into the prayer. In, in the Anglican tradition, I'm not sure if it's in other traditions or not. I just know that it is in the Anglican tradition that we, we bow at the name of Jesus. 
uh, throughout the liturgy. Uh, and in fact, you'll see, even see some readers when they're up there reading, uh, whenever the name of Jesus comes across, they will make a, a, a slight bow right there. And because the reality is that one day every, I mean, it says knee will bow, but we might as well get started practicing of being aware when the name of Jesus comes, because one day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So we might as well get started now. So the, there are other parts in, in prayer. A lot of times we will just bow our heads and close our eyes if, that, if that's helpful for us. Um, but that's the simple bow. Then we have what is called the more the solemn bow. And this, uh, the, we, we use it in a couple of different places. People who are involved in the leading of the, uh, of the liturgy up front that are usually vested, uh, wearing you know, fancy clothes or whatever, um, they will use this bow a little more frequently and it will often be every time they pass in front of the, uh, the holy table, the altar. And, um, but the, the, the solemn bow is just bowing from the waist and you can either do that with your hands by your side. Uh, liturgically, I always train our people that are uh, helping, with, uh, helping with the service to put your hands together, your, your fingers kind of touching. I, I make a cross with my thumbs like that, just like that, in front of you at your waist, and you bow down. It's a very simple bow. I mean, it's called the solemn bow, but it's very simple to do. Uh, the solemn bow, and it's, it's a deep bow. You know, it, it's not just the the slight bow of the simple bow. It is a deep bow. I always hold it for at least long enough to say, Lord Jesus Christ. And I try to bring to mind that I am bowing to a king, that there is a king, and it's not me. Uh, and th this world, do, do, regardless of what your favorite um, political system or governing system might be, it, the reality is, in the final analysis, we live in a monarchy, and there is a king. And uh, so I want to bow to him. So the times that we do the solemn bow, you can do any of these bows whenever, uh, but the times when we generally do the solemn bow are um, whenever the Trinity is named out. So at the end of the Psalms or in other parts where we would say something like, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So we would bow whenever we say, uh, when we name out the whole Trinity. Uh, like I said, oftentimes uh, passing in front of the altar, we'll bow. Uh, usually, if you're coming into a church that has pews and has a center aisle, or even doesn't have a center aisle, if it has pews, as you walk down the aisle, uh, people will bow before they enter the pew and then bow once again when exiting the pew, even if they're going forward to receive communion, they'll make a bow there. And then we also, uh, we bow in, in our service, we bow during the Trisagion when we sing, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal. We bow and make the sign of the cross, just our custom down here. Uh, but we bow and make the sign of the cross uh, during that Holy God first part. We hold that bow for a long time. You know, when, when we teach this, so that's, I told you about embodying our commitments with the, how we teach that with our teachers. When we teach bowing with uh, our students at the school, we usually start off by asking, you know, kind of a softball question for those who've been at, in church, uh, at least. We say, who uh, is the king of all creation? And they usually can say, at least God or Jesus uh, one of those two uh, is the answer. And then we say, right. And then we say, well, what do you do when you come before a king to show him respect? And they usually will say bow because they've seen at least enough movies or comic books or whatever it might be to know that you bow before a king. And then we talk about how, you know, you could. Uh, so when we come before Jesus uh, for worship or for prayer, he's always present. Um, we bow to bring our hearts and our minds to the reality that He is the King and we are His servants. And then we talk about how Jesus is everywhere present. And so really we, we could bow in any direction that we wanted to because He's everywhere. But 
so that we don't bump our heads, is the way we talk about it with the elementary school. So we don't bump our heads, we all bow in the same direction. And, you know, historically within the church, that has been towards the front, whether it's towards the table, towards the cross, towards the east, towards uh, a consecrated bread and wine, whatever it might be, it's towards the front. And so that will get you in all the churches. You'll be cool if you bow towards the front. And um, we're bowing to the king. You know, and, and then the last, the last thing I just guess I want to share with you guys is, um, you know, this experience of bowing has become incredibly profound for me. And I, and I hope that it will for you as well. Like I said, every time I bow, I, I try to bring to mind the, just the words, Lord Jesus Christ. I remembered very clearly uh, worshiping when we were up in the hill country of Texas and worshiping. And, you know, another time that we often will make more of a solemn bow is the procession at the beginning. As the cross passes our aisle, we will usually bow. And then when, when the cross recesses at the end of the service, as it passes our, our aisle, uh, we will bow down. And I remember being at this, at this worship service and just thinking through a lot of things about the hardness of the world and the goodness of God and the desire for the king to come and to see him face to face and to live the fullness of, 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 of the new creation. And, uh, and that cross started coming and I started looking at it and I started realizing that like, it's just not just a cross. I mean, it's not just like a... a, a, a symbol up there it is a symbol in the more fuller sense that it it manifests it is a place from direction for me to bow to my king to my lord and savior and as it came i just in tears i bowed down and was just overwhelmed with the reality that uh that i have a savior who is the king who is a good king and is coming for his own and um I hope that you will, if you're new to bowing or never done it before or just now trying out things of traditional Christianity in general, I hope that you'll have that same sort of experience where you recognize that this, this action, this embodiment is an embodiment of your commitments and that what you're doing is a reality of, of offering your, your, your allegiance, you know, your respect, your honor, everything you have to your Lord and Savior, who is King of all creation. As always, it's been great to have you joining me here today. Thanks. God bless you on your journey.